wonders and the whole idea about natural wonders, just to catch you up to speed, is that I think, this is what I believe, I, I believe that God makes us in such a way that we naturally wonder about him. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. What we've been talking through is we've been talking through Acts 17. And if you haven't read Acts 17, you probably should. It's, it's significant to this talk. And even though tonight I'm not going to be teaching out of Acts 17, and I did last week and I did the week before, and I may even go back there next week, that the whole idea is this, is that, that, um, got, that Paul, after he got out of jail, after he had gotten out of being beaten for sharing Christ, he decided to go to Athens. And Athens is at the time, the culture at the time, it is like this metroplex of knowledge. And they are really into knowledge. And so he's waiting for Barnabas and a couple other guys to show up. And so he's just kind of wandering around the city. You ever go someplace and you're waiting for people, and so you just kind of drive around the town? I mean, maybe it's Denver, maybe it's Salt Lake, maybe it's whatever. But you just are like, hey, I'm going to go check this thing out. And so that's what Paul is doing. And as he does that, it's really cool. Because he begins to recognize things. And he begins to recognize that the city of Athens is caught up in other gods. That they have this real desire for gods. And they have hundreds of gods. And everywhere he goes, there's a statue of a new, of a new god. And then he comes across this one statue that's in the very center of the city. And it says, to the unknown god. And that makes him go, you know what? If these people are looking for god through gods then let me take some time and explain to them what they're looking for. And he begins to go and he, he begins to teach in the synagogue. But the point being is this, that what we've talked about the past two weeks is just simply this, that I believe with all my heart that God makes us in such a way that we wonder about him naturally. Psalm 66 says that my soul thirsts for you, my whole body longs for you, that, that without me needing to, that I have these natural cravings to know God. And I would say that everybody experiences those. And then Isaiah, he turns around and he says, my bones cry out for you, that, that I need you so bad that my bones ache because of that desired relationship to have you. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm a natural wanderer. I wonder about things all the time. I, I, I wonder about things. And so here's what I was wondering this week. That, that why is it natural for me to wonder towards God and look for him? That even when I was not a Christian, I wondered about God. How, how many of you guys did not grow up in the church, but before you made a commitment in your life to Christ, you kind of began to wonder about God? Yeah. Yeah, if you look around, there's all kinds of hands up. And, and so before I gave my life to Christ, there was this natural wondering in my life about who he was and what it looked like and how that thing played out. And then there's this other dichotomy that happens in my life, and that's this. I've given my life to Christ, then how come... I naturally wonder from him. Oh, that'll screw you up. Won't that screw you up? That there's this point and there's this time that you're looking for him and you're, you are looking for God. And then you discover him or maybe you're still looking for him and you're still looking to discover him. I was watching the MTV um, Music Awards this past week and I can't even tell you which band it was um, somebody will tell me after service, I guarantee it. But they got up, and they were giving their praises, and one guy says, he says, he says I want to just give a shout-out to God. He says, I'm not sure which one that is yet. He says, I haven't figured out which one I serve, but I know I'm looking for him, and so I'm just giving it up to God. Did you guys, anybody see that? Okay, and I'm watching that thing, and I'm like, that's really interesting because I think in our bones, we have this natural tendency to wonder about God, which causes us to W-A-N-D-R, wonder to him, which is exactly what Acts 17 is about. And then, once we get into a relationship with him, don't we constantly find ourselves W-A-N-D-E-R, wondering from him? I'm the only one? We all do it, right? Okay, so now I really want to screw you up. Are you guys ready to be screwed up? You guys ready for that? 
Okay. Adam and Eve wandered from God. And they traded their relationship for some fruit. Have you guys ever thought about that? I mean, think about that for just a second. That these guys walked and talked with God. They, they weren't just like, like you and I, we have not got to see him yet. But there will come a day where we will be in his presence. There will be a day where we will spend eternity with God. And from your standpoint and my standpoint, that cannot be any, there cannot be anything greater than that idea. Right? I mean, that, that one day you and I will get to be in the presence of God all the time. Instead of just seeking him and talking to him at a distance, we will know him full well and have presence with him. But in that presence that Adam and Eve had, which you and I desire, they traded that relationship for some fruit. Bottom, bottom line, it was for some fruit. It, it, it was for something that they didn't have. It was for something that, the, that they thought would give them a little more control over their life. It was for something that they didn't feel like God fulfilled. And so, in wondering about God, I had to ask the question, how come we wander from God? And so if you flip your Bibles over to Romans chapter 7, you see this story. And it's really not even a story. It's the same guy that was walking through Athens, Paul, and now he's writing a letter to the Roman church. And it's really interesting because in what he was writing about... Um, in, in Acts 17, which was written um, from Levi, which was a friend of Paul, but also a friend of Peter, and that story was conveyed to Levi, um, and so he wrote that thing out, and he wrote the story about Paul going through Athens. So the same guy that's saying, hey, this is how you do it. This is how you live a life that honors God. This is, this is God. He turns around and he writes these words, which are absolutely confusing on one level and make so much sense on another level. And I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation. And instead of reading it out of my Bible, I print it. And the reason I print it is because my writing is so little in my Bible, I don't want to lose it. And it says this. This is the New Living Translation, Romans 7, 14 through 25. And he's just talked about the law. And what, he's, what, he's, what he said is, the reason that we have a law isn't to identify... Um, um, good people, the law actually identifies people who have gone astray. And so if you're doing good, don't worry about it. But if you're not doing good, then this will prove that the law needs to exist. And then he says this. He says, so this is the proof that the law is good then. He says, the trouble is not with the law, but with me. When I was in high school, this is a story on the side that's not even in my notes, but when I was in high school, I, I did a whole bunch of stuff that I shouldn't have done. You ever do that in high school? Yeah, I'm looking down. I'm not going to look at any of you because I feel guilty. And I did a whole bunch of stuff that I wasn't supposed to do in high school, and so my brother got upset with me, and he made me turn myself into the police. And as I went down and turned myself into the police, I looked at this police officer, and I told him my story, and I told him all the things that I did. And it was so amazing because when, when it says that the law is good then, and then the trouble is not with the law but with me, so I tell this police officer my story, and he looks right at my eyes. And he says, Mr. Watson, first time anybody had called me Mr. Watson. He said, Mr. Watson, I believe your story. He said, so if you just turn around against that wall and spread your hands and spread your legs, I'll read you your rights, you're going to jail. And it was at that point in time that I realized the problem was not with the law, the problem was with me. Because the law only proved that the things that I did were bad. But I already knew they were bad. He says, because I am sold into slavery with sin as my master, I don't understand myself at all. You ever come to that place? For I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing that I hate. I know perfectly well that what I'm doing is wrong. And my bad conscience shows that I agree that the law is good. 
He says, but I can't help myself. Have you ever done that? But I can't help myself. You know what you're doing is wrong, but you do it anyway. All right, there's only three of us. The rest of you are liars. Because that's where we live. We know that, man, it's like, I know I shouldn't be doing this. And then we go do it. And sometimes not only do we know that we shouldn't be doing it, but we run to do it with smiles on our faces. Right? But I can't help myself. Why? Because it is sin inside me that makes me do these evil things. I know I'm rotten through and through. Amen. So as far as my old sin for nature, nature is concerned, no matter which way I turn, man, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. You see, when I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. See, if we were in a Baptist church, everybody would be saying amen, but because we're in the vineyard, everybody's quiet and like, I hope he doesn't look at me. I, I hope he doesn't look at me because I'm feeling pretty guilty right now. But if I am doing what I don't want to do, catch this, this is so cool, then I am not really the one doing it. You see, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, if every time I try to do right, I can't do right, then I'm not really the one that's doing it. The sin within me is doing it. And here's what he's saying. This proves that there is sin. This proves that there is sin. The fact that you, you, you want to say that you don't believe in God? You want to say that you don't believe in Satan? Or maybe there's a whole group of people that they just want to believe in God and not believe in Satan? Then try and do right. Because you can't. Because sin exists in all of us. Sin exists in all of us. He says it seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, man, I inevitably do what is wrong. And I love God's law with all my heart. This isn't just for sinners. This is for people who love God. But there is another law at work within me that is at war with my mind. The law wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Have you ever woke up the day after a bad decision and stayed in bed because you didn't want to face life? Like if you make a really bad decision, you know, what, you know what the effect of that decision is? The effect is that you do not want to get out of bed. You do not want to face life. Have you avoided a person because you didn't want to look them in the eyes because of the decision you've made? Right? Why? Because I am a miserable person because of the sin that resides in me. Who will free men from this life that is dominated by sin. Verse 25. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see? You see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. And you think that you would end this right there because that would be the end of Romans 7. But really, Romans 7 and Romans 8 continue. It's really one passage. And the author who broke up the Bible broke it up in the wrong spot. Because Paul goes on to say, you see, he says, because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. But then Paul continued to write this passage. And what he wrote was, but remember, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. For the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you through Christ Jesus from this power that leads to death. You see, here's what I think is interesting. When you're wondering out loud, you want to say, what's the benefit of having a relationship with God? We well, see one of the benefits is, 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 uh, as a benefit of having a relationship with God is this, is that people without that relationship with God, I believe, have a much harder time of getting past their past because they have no help with it. Where if you have a relationship with God, everybody sins, everybody blows it. But because of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can come to the conclusion that therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you through Christ Jesus from the power of sin that leads to death. So here's what I believe. 
I believe that we naturally wonder about God. And we naturally wonder from God. So what is the fruit that's in your life? What is the fruit that keeps you wandering away from God? Everybody has it. And see, I believe this. I believe there's two things. I, I know there's more than that. But there's two things that we're going to talk about. You see, I believe that you and I naturally wander from God because we lack the ability to control ourselves. That, it's, it's, it's that simple. You and I do not have the ability inside us to control ourselves. And that doesn't mean that we're freaks and that we can just, we have no control and so therefore we go and do whatever we want to do. We have some control, but we don't have all control, do we? Here's one. Try and control your eyes for 24 hours. You can't do it. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever made a conscious effort? Okay, this is especially true for guys because guys are driven by the physical and I know that girls have their things that drive them too, like credit cards and chocolate. <laughs> Amen. Southern Baptist Church, there you go. And I know that girls have their things, but guys, come on. Try and control your eyes for 24 hours. You've actually come to the conclusion that it would be easier to have your eyeballs poked out of your head than it is to control them. Amen? I mean, it's just like this impossible thing. You're like, okay, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. Whoa, my gosh. <laughs> God, you are amazing. I just spit everywhere. <laughs> just the whole idea of that is screwing me up. It's just, you look at that and you just go, we don't. That's exactly what Paul was talking about in Romans 7 when he went through verses 15 and 17. Man, I don't understand myself at all all i really want to do what's right but i don't do it instead i do the very thing i hate i know perfectly well what i am doing is wrong it's my bad conscience it shows me to grease with the law that is good but the truth is i can't help myself because of the sin inside me. It makes me do these evil things. Let me give you some examples. Because I want, you, I want to walk down this road just a little bit. Because, like I said, we naturally wonder about God and wonder to Him, but we also naturally wonder from Him. Have you ever been in... You don't have to raise your hand on this. It's probably wise if you don't. But have you ever been in a relationship that kept getting physical... And you didn't want it to get physical, but you guys just liked each other way too much. And God gave you two hands, right? I mean, what are you going to do with those two hands? You can do something with them. Like, oh, that's not funny, Paul. Can we talk about that in church this year? <laughs> and so you're like, yeah, that's true. But we can't really talk about that. And then when you're done with the relationship, and I don't mean like done with the relationship, I mean like you go to your place and they go to their place because you're not married. The guilt comes back in and says, oh, you see, that's the proof that there is a God. Because otherwise, why would your conscience drive you back to ask the question? How about the anger that gets inside of you? I don't know if you've ever really lost it. I mean, one of those, like, beat on the steering wheel, lose it type of things. Or, like, for the guys, punch a wall type of thing. Or for maybe a girl that you're so angry that you are just crying. And they are not tears of sadness. They are tears of, I'm going to kill you and rip out your throat. <laughs> and you have that anger inside of you. And you think to yourself, why am I so emotional about this? How about this one? I experience this one every year. I make this great plan to go on a diet, but I have no control over my cravings. <laughs> New York cheesecake is amazing. And you know what? When you're sitting watching a game, you need 10 types of snacks. 
And that's what happens, and, and you know that you shouldn't be controlling your cravings, but there's no control over those cravings. I mean, you just keep going through the list. Try and control your thoughts. I mean, there are thoughts that roll through our heads that we would never, ever want anybody to know that we think those things. And the very thoughts that roll through your head, you wish that you didn't think those things. And you try not to. But they're there naturally. Because we naturally wander from God. And have you ever tried to control your tongue when you've had a great piece of information that you just want to share? You know something about somebody that nobody else knows? And then you try and act like it's like not a big deal? But you're in a conversation and you're like, they're talking about sports car and you say, hey, do you know about John? He lost his job. Oh, we should probably pray for him. And we naturally wonder. And you see, here's the second thing that I think that we do. Oh, wait, I'm so sorry. See, here's the, here's the conclusion that I want you to come to. You see, and one of the, naturally one, the, one of the reasons that we naturally wonder from God is because of this. You see, what happens is we draw this conclusion, and the conclusion goes something like this, and if you have your paper, you might want to write this down. It's really not super intellectual, but what we do is we do this. We try and we try and we try and we work out our life before God, but we keep doing these things that we have no control over. And then we draw the conclusion that says, if I can't be good for God, then maybe I'm not good enough for God. If I can't be good for God, if I can't do what's right, if, if, if I keep trying to do what's right, but I don't do what's right, and if I keep trying to do what's right, but I don't do what's right, and if I can't control myself, if I can't control my cravings or my thoughts or my eyes or my anger, if I can't be good for God, then at some level, I must not be good enough for Him. And if I'm not good enough for Him, then why should I even try and serve him? And we walk away. Guys, this is so significant. You gotta, you gotta keep with me because this is so significant. You see, here's what I think the second thing that happens is. Is we draw the conclusion that we're not good enough for God. And then the second thing that causes us to wonder from God is that when we draw that conclusion we come up with another conclusion. And the other conclusion is I lack the ability to forgive myself. You see, we do these things. We do these things. Don't you know? Don't you wonder how long it took Eve and Adam to get, off of, to, to, to get over their broken relationship? I bet that took a while. Do you guys think that took a while? I, I bet that took a while. And if it takes a while for us to work out our relationship with God, how much longer does it take to work out our relationship with ourselves? See, if we were really honest, and, and we're not going to be really honest today, okay? We're going to be kind of honest. And what I mean by that is this. We're going to be honest from this side, but I, but I know that there are struggles, but everybody has this thing that is like, we all have these things that we've done to ourselves where we have a hard time of forgiving ourselves. We may be, have forgiven the people and we may have even been forgiven by people. But because the wounds are so deep, because we traded in the relationships for something meaningless, that now we have a hard time in forgiving ourselves. And that's exactly what Paul was saying. Verses 18 and 19. You see, here's the deal. I know I'm rotten through and through. That when we really examine ourselves, don't you, at the end of the day, you go, you know what? I know I'm rotten through and through. So as far as my sinful nature is concerned, because no matter which way I turn, man, I can't make myself do right. 
I want to, but I can't. I want to do good, but I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. You see, because we lack the ability to control ourselves, we do things that are wrong. We get into relationships that become way too physical. We get into emotions that build up inside us and build up inside us and build up inside us, and that anger blows, and it blows all the time, and and it's something that we hate about ourselves. We hate the fact that we can't control our cravings. We hate the fact that we can't control our thoughts. We hate the fact that we can't control our eyes, even though that's hurt the people we love many, many times. And we hate the fact that we gossip about people. And we have and lack the ability to forgive ourselves for one reason. Because we know what we're doing is wrong. That's it. Because we know what we're doing is wrong. And so then we draw the second portion of the conclusion. Remember, the first portion of the conclusion is this. If I can't be good for God, then maybe I'm not good enough for God. And if I can't forgive myself, then how could he ever forgive me? You see, our natural tendency to wander from God is based upon two lies. That God can't forgive me because I don't have the ability to forgive myself. And because I'm not good, I'm not good for him. But what we forget it is that it's not the requirement on us to be good. Right? God never said, be good enough and come to me. He said, I'm coming to you because I am good. I'm bringing relationship to you because you don't have the ability to bring relationship to me. And that is why our bodies crave him. That is why our bones cry out for him. See, here's the, the, the third thing, the, sec, the second point, but the, really the third thing that I want you to catch. And don't miss this, because this is huge. You see, sin separates us from God, but it does not separate God from us. Sin separates us from God. And this really screwed me up all week long. I wrote this point earlier in the week, and I've really been contemplating on this, and I've been going, okay, now I know that my sin separates me from God. I know that I choose things that are meaningless compared to a relationship with God, and I know that God is not a part of those things. Well, doesn't at some point that mean that he, that, doesn't at some point that mean that he rejects me? I mean, at some point, if, if my stuff separates me from him, how can that not mean that he doesn't reject me? Fair question? Am I asking a fair question? Because, because that's the deal. You look at Adam and Eve and you go, wait, he kicked them out of the garden. He said, he said sorry, guys, you and I were different. He kicked me out of the garden. But did he? Check this out. Because you flip over and it says, this is Paul's conclusion, who he's thought about this. He said, no, the answer, the answer is Christ. Lord, you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's laws. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. He, he's, saying, he's saying that there's this thing inside me that I, I never get it right. But you still love me for who I am. Sin separates us from God, but God doesn't separate him from himself. And so I'm thinking about this process, and I'm thinking, how does that work out? How many of you guys remember going through this period? Some of you guys are in this period right now. And you live with your parents, or you lived with your parents, and you hit this point in your life where you just wanted to play all the time. Remember that? And it is just like, man, I just want to play all the time. and I just want to do these things. And then your parents sit you down and you sit around the coffee table. And they remind you, hey, man, I love you. Remember that? I love you. 
But you need to know, if you're going to choose to live this lifestyle, you don't get to live it in my home. Right? You need to know that if you're going to come home drunk, we're not a house that does that. And so if that's the lifestyle you want to live, go live it. But you don't get to live it here. And, and, and if you want to stay out till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, hey, that's all well and good. But you see, if you're going to live here, the rule is you're going to be home by about 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And you remember going, are you kidding me? 11, 30, 12 o'clock, that's what I did in high school. <laughs> and they looked at you and said, yeah, we know. And that's still a good time. And then you and I, we looked back at our parents and we said, okay, dude, I'm going to go get my own place. Right? And we went out and got our own place. And then you got your own place and you think this is the way to live. And so you live in this way. And all of a sudden, you keep doing that long enough. And some of you guys aren't there yet. But I guarantee you will get there. You keep doing that long enough and you realize, hey, this isn't the way to live. And so you restore back to your parents' value systems. Not because your parents had these god-awful rules, but because they discovered there's a way to live. You see, what happened with God and Adam and Eve was he said, hey, here's what it takes to live in my presence. This is, this is what, what it takes to live in the garden. And Adam and Eve said, oh, hey, that's good for you, God, but that's not good for me. As a matter of fact, I want to do these things. And God, because of free will, said, go do them. Go do them. And they said, okay, we're going to. And they did. And it was upon doing those things, they realized how wise and good God was. And so what happened was this. Just as when your parents say, hey, go live the lifestyle you want to. They don't break off and say, well, if you're going to go live that way, we're not going to love you anymore. As a matter of fact, I have found that most people have a better relationship with their parents after they move out. Right? <laughs> You're like, okay, Baptist, here we go, amen. Now, I love my mom and dad now because we live in separate places. You see, sin separates us from God, but it doesn't separate us. Sin separates us from God, but it doesn't separate God from us. As a matter of fact, this is going to come as an odd statement. As a matter of fact, many times it's our sinful lifestyle that solidifies our relationship with God. That many times that we find God and we wander back to him because of the place that we are in our life. Remember the story of the prodigal son and the prodigal son goes to his dad and his dad says, hey, this is the way we're going to live in our house. And he says, hey, that's not the way I want to live. As a matter of fact, old man, I want my inheritance now, which really was a blatant statement that said, I wish you were dead. Give me the money. Your living is getting in the way of me living. I want the money. And his dad said, okay, go do it. And it was ongoing and doing it that the prodigal son realized how much he had, how good his father was, and how much he needed to get back to that lifestyle. And what's interesting is that what Paul is saying is that it's because I do wrong that God comes to me in my sinfulness and says, come home. And that many times the, the, the voice of God is stronger in that lifestyle than it is in the prodigal son's brother who stayed at home and just did what was good. Why? Because there's this crying out from God that says, don't do that anymore. And some of you guys are in that place where you've wandered from God. And you wonder about him because his voice is strong to you. And he's saying, don't do that anymore. It's going to ruin your life. Come home. Come back to that relationship. You see, you will always be deceived when you believe that you have the um, power to overcome the things that you're struggling with. If you do, you would have did it a long time ago because people don't want to struggle. Here's the last thing I want you to write down and then we're done. 
You see, restoration occurs when we recognize our need for God. You see, we wander from Him, and then we wonder about Him. But wondering about God does not bring restoration. There are many people who wonder about God. There are many people who are far from God that have wandered from Him. And now they wonder about Him, and they don't have restoration to Him. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another law at work within me. And it's at war with my mind. The law wins the fight and makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? There's only one way to get free from the guilt and the domination of the lifestyle that you live in, and that is to return to God. You see, here's what I believe. I believe that our body recognizes God. Our body cries out for Him, just like we talked about in Psalm 63, 1 and Jeremiah 20. That our bones cry out for Him and thirst for Him. And it's almost like this, and this is an image that way too many people can identify with right now. If you did not grow up with a steady father in your life, there is this natural craving to have a father. If you didn't grow up with that father relationship, and I've had way too much experience with dealing with kids and doing youth ministry for 17 years and having so many kids look me in the eyes and just say, you know what, I just want to know my dad. I just want to have that recognition towards my father. You see, here's what happens. When you're in a lifestyle that is rejecting God, your body just craves to know God and to have relationship with the Father. And so here's my ask for you tonight. What is? What is the fruit that you've traded for your relationship with God? What is it? What is it that you are wondering about God that's keeping you from wondering towards God? What is the idea that the enemy has sold you on that has become more tempting to walk in in right relationship? You see, here's the deal with God. He will allow you to go your own way. But that's not his plan for your life. His plan for your life is that he would provide for you everything you need because he's God, the God of the heavens and of the earth, that he places his foot upon the earth as a footstool, which just basically means this. He has control over the whole situation. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And as the worship team comes back up, we're going to close with one last song. This is probably my favorite worship song. And it just says that many men will seek things and never seek God. But you were meant to seek God. And many of you have known God, but you've walked away from Him. And here's the cool deal. Verse 8 and 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And here's what I want you guys to get. And This was supposed to be in my notes about halfway through, and I, I jumped past it. But I watched this thing happen. And I watch it happen all the time. I got to watch it happen this weekend again. And it was this idea that at, at this weekend service, I, I, I taught this weekend service, and I felt real strong conviction at a certain point during the message to just say, if you don't have a relationship with God, just raise your hand, and you can have one. And we had dozens of hands go up through the service. And I watch this happen all the time. And people who I know to have a relationship with God will raise their hand. And here's what happens. is There's this teaching in the church that says, if you sin, you've lost your relationship with Christ. And it's just not true. The reason that we need a relationship with Christ is we sin. That we sinned yesterday and we'll probably sin sometime this next week. And it's that that we live in. So we stand upon first, or Romans chapter 8, which says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All you got to do is return. All you got to do is ask for forgiveness. 
You're not looking to have a new relationship with Christ. You're just looking to get the grace and forgiveness that comes with having a relationship with Christ. Now, every time that somebody that had a relationship with Christ would come to Jesus and say, hey, I've blown it. Here's what Jesus would turn and say. He'd say, I forgive you. Now, don't go do that anymore. Why? Because it's not the wise way to live. It doesn't bring glory and honor to God. So during this last song, would you seek God? And if you need to make some things right, would you make some things right? And if you've never had a relationship to him, maybe you could begin to wonder about that and maybe ask some questions tonight, maybe ask some questions. And Acts 17 says that you feel your way towards him and you find him. And the reason you find him is because he's not far from any of us. Whether we're close to him or we're far away from him, he's still close to us. Let's worship. Thank you.